What I'd like to talk to you about today is how you can understand the Bible, how you can hear from God when you get in the Bible and hear God speak to you, because there's absolutely nothing more transforming in your life than that. But the truth is that many people, uh, many Christians read the Bible and you know, they know they're supposed to read the Bible because we're Christians. The Christians are supposed to read the Bible. But many of us, when we read the Bible, we don't get a whole lot out of it. We read the Bible and we don't understand it. And we just think that maybe understanding the Bible is for people, you know, who are like scholars or really smart or, you know, especially spiritual people, whoever that is. And, and we sort of just maybe over time resign ourselves to the fact that I guess I'm just not going to really be able to understand it. But God wants to speak to you through the Bible. If you were to hire a world famous sculptor to create a statue of someone that you loved so that the statue would be an image of that person. That sculptor would have tools that he would use to begin to form and transform that block of stone into the image of the one that you love. But if somehow you took away his tools, his hammer and his chisel, I don't care how talented and how great that sculptor would be, if he didn't have his tools, it'd be very difficult for him to create this image of the one that you love. The Bible tells us, we started talking about last week, the Bible tells us that the moment you gave your life to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God came to live inside of you and instantaneously began to do a work of transforming you into the image of the one God loves, his son. So God, the Holy Spirit is at work in your life, working in you to bring about your transformation into the very image of Jesus. And he has many tools that he uses to accomplish that. But the primary tool that he uses to transform our lives is the word of God, the scriptures. And if you and I do not spend time in the scriptures and know how to hear from him in the scriptures, it's like taking away the hammer and chisel from a sculptor. If the main tool he uses is to, trans, to transform you into the likeness of Christ is his word, and you don't get in the word, then you are limiting. I don't care how powerful he is, he's chosen to work through that means. And if you don't cooperate with him, then his work in your life is going to be impeded and slowed. And so God wants to speak to you through his word. But for many of us as believers, we... Um, we don't get much out of the Bible. Sometimes we read the Bible, we're bored. Sometimes we read it and we don't understand it. And if we're not careful, what will begin to happen is that over time, we will get to where we don't really expect to hear from God when we read the Bible. We will, we will start reading it and we read it because it's sort of, it's the thing to do. We read it because it's on my checklist of my uh, my to-do list of what a good Christian ought to do. And so I read my, I have my Bible reading, and so I read it, but I don't really expect to hear from God. And if you don't expect to hear from God, the Bible says that whatever is not of faith is sin. And when we're not expecting to hear from God, then that may be one of the very reasons why we often do not. Now, I'm not going to talk about this today because I'm trying to put you on a guilt trip and try to make you feel bad about the fact that you don't and haven't been studying your Bible, maybe as you should, but the opposite of that. What I really hope will come from this message today is that you will begin to believe again that God wants to speak to you and that you'll learn some simple tools today that you can use as you study the Bible that will enable God to speak to you. And so that when you get alone with God in his word, that it will be just this incredible time where God's talking to you and he's beginning to transform your life. So that's my hope and prayer for you today. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says in beginning in verse 12, it says, everyone who wants to live godly, a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 
And while evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, Timothy, Paul's writing to Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. How from an infancy, how from a real baby, you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God breathed or inspired, some of your translations say, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible, all scripture is God breathed, it's inspired. The inspiration of the scriptures, the word inspired does not mean in the Bible what we tend to mean today in our contemporary culture. We use the word inspired, you know, we will say, man, I heard that, that person speaking and man, it really inspired me. What they mean by that is it motivated me or it, it encouraged me or it lifted me up and it challenged me. Or I read this really inspiring book or I saw this really inspiring movie and what we mean by that is it motivates us and it encourages us and lifts us, our spirits. But that's not what the Bible word inspired means. It means literally God breathed. And what that is referring to is like when you and I talk, we force our breath over our vocal cords to form our words, right? So the Bible is the very words of God. He breathes, he, he creates, he he speaks the word of God and the Bible, all scripture is breathed by God. It means God is the one, he's the source of this. These are the very words of God. It is inspired. Inspiration means the written revelation of God. It's God revealing himself. You see the Bible, the Bible is God's autobiography. He wrote this Bible, this scriptures, he wrote this. He breathed it out himself and he did it so you and I could know what he's like. So you and I could know what he wants from us, why we are here, what he, what he has planned for us. All those things that God reveals that there's no other way that we would ever be able to know it. You and I could never figure God out. God is so massive. God is so colossal. God is so incredibly infinite in every way that our little pea brains could never logically figure God out. So God says, I'm gonna reveal myself to you. And that's what the Bible is. It's God's self-revelation. It's his autobiography. And he wrote it himself. God breathed. Now, the Bible tells us that God speaks in lots of ways. He speaks, for example, through nature and through creation. There's a passage in Psalm 19 that says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the works of his hands. Day after day, the heavens declare that, or they pour forth speech and night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world, in the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. And he goes on in talking about that. The Bible says through the creation that God made of the heavens, that day and night, the heavens are declaring the glory of God. They're saying, they're, they're, without saying a word, they are proclaiming that the one who did this is powerful. The one who did this is awesome. The one who did this is greater than we are. The one who did this must be organized. He must be smart. There's so many things we can learn about God through creation. But when we look at the revelation, God has revealed himself through creation. We can learn some things, but you can't look at the creation and say, well, God's loving, or God's merciful, or God is gracious, or God is kind, or, and so many things. And so God revealed that to you and me through his word. So the scriptures are inspired. They are revelation that's been written down. That's what it means. It's God breathed. 
Now the Bible says that when God did this, he spoke these words, but he did it and he had it written down through people. In 2 Peter chapter 1, it says in verse 20, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. In other words, man didn't decide to sit down and write this for God, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The words carried along there just means the Spirit of God was, was, was leading this whole thing. He was superintending over this entire process. So that God spoke, but he did it through men. He wrote it down. Now, he did this over a period of 14, 1,500 years. He used approximately 40 different human authors. They came from all walks of life. Some were kings, some were farmers, some were diplomats, and some were fishermen. Some were tax collectors. They came from all different walks of life. They spoke different languages. They lived in different cultures. They lived in different time periods. And yet, in spite of that, in spite of all their differences, and many of them, they, they didn't even know each other. There was no correlation. They didn't get together and, and sit down together and compare notes and, and say, okay, now we're going to write this. And uh, They didn't know each other. They were separated from around the, the world. They were different time periods, different languages, different cultures. And yet, in spite of all of that, the Bible is unified from start to finish. It's the same message. It doesn't contradict itself. It is one unified theme all the way through. And the only way that is possible is because God is the author. He's the one who was, was speaking it. I want you to think with me for a minute. Let's suppose, I mean, the Bible addresses the most profound questions in the world. Where did we come from? What happens when we die? If there's a heaven, how do we get there? What's my purpose in living? All of these, I mean, questions that mankind has been asking for since their origin. Well, if you and I were to right now go out here on the street, and if we were to randomly pick 40 people, and we were to say to them, okay, where do you think mankind came from? And what happens when we die? And what do you think a person would have to do? If there's a heaven, what do you think they'd have to do to go there? And what do you think the purpose of, of mankind, the purpose of life is? What do you think is the probability that all 40 of them would say the exact same thing? Not very, not very good probability, right? Now imagine that we did the same thing, but instead of getting 40 people off the same the street out here who all live in this area at the same time, same time period who all pretty much speak the same language, imagine that instead of that, we went around the world and we picked different cultures and we asked those questions of people who spoke different languages. And then imagine that we also picked somebody from 100 years ago and then somebody from 500 years ago, then somebody from the Middle Ages, and we ask them those questions. What do you think is the probability that they would all say the same thing? Basically zero, right? These are profound questions. And yet the Bible, through 40 different authors who spoke different languages over 1,500 years from different countries, different circumstances, different stages of life, different life experiences, they all said the same thing. And you know why? because God was the author. The unity of the Bible is a miraculous thing, but God spoke, it was inspired. God breathed out those words, but then he had it written down through human authors. And yet when he did that, he didn't, it wasn't like God dictating, and he dictated some of it, the 10 commandments, he dictated some of it, but he would move, the Holy Spirit would move upon them so that those authors used their own vocabulary. They used their life experiences as illustrations. They used their personalities come out in their writings. Now, the reason I've taken a moment to, to go into all of that is because I want you to see that 
that though the Bible is written by God, it is a supernatural book, but I want you to also realize the Bible is a human book. It has a human element to it. It was written by God through men for men using human language. Now, as obvious as that sounds, the truth is many of us don't hear from God through the Bible because we treat the Bible differently than we treat other books. We read the Bible and almost act as though it's the magic eight ball or something. We read the Bible as though it's a magic book. We will, we will just grab the Bible and without any context of what is the passage is about without knowing who wrote, it, wrote that passage, without knowing who's being addressed, what questions are being, we'll just open the Bible to a spot and we'll just start reading and then expect God to speak to us. And if you do that, if you read that, and I'm not saying God will not occasionally, I mean, he's done that with me. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I've opened the Bible before and God has spoken to me, but that is not the norm, okay? And if you want to consistently hear from God, that you need to understand that God wrote this, but he did it through humans, for humans, using human language. So when you read the Bible, if you want to understand it, you have to use some common sense. You have to read the Bible in the way that you would read other types of books. There's nobody here that if I walked up to you and I handed you a book and I said, I want to tell you, this is a great book. It's one of the most life-changing, profound books I've ever read. I'd love for, for you to have a copy of it. And I gave you a book. There's nobody here who would take that book home and open it up in the middle and go and read a, a, a half a page and then shut it. And then the next day, pick it up and turn to the back of that book and read it, a, pa a passage. And then sit it down and maybe a week later, you get back to it. You go to, you know, a quarter of the way through and you point to it. And so a couple of weeks later, I see you and I go, hey, how's the book? And you would go, you know, I don't really understand that book. Well, of course you don't understand it. And so when you're reading the Bible, read it with some common sense. If you go to read the book of Ephesians or you go to read in the New Testament and you, you pick one of those books, then start at the beginning of that book. You ought to ask a few questions. Who's writing this book? Who, who's receiving this book? Who was the audience that the author was writing to? What is the time period here? What's the circumstances that are going on? Now you may go, well, how would I know that? How do I figure that out? Well, we have got so many wonderful tools available to us today. If you, if you went to a Christian bookstore, you could find a, um, a study Bible. It's, it's called that, a study Bible. And there are all kinds of different study Bibles. And most study Bibles will, in, their, in the Bible, it will have a few pages of introduction into every book of the Bible. And in those study Bibles, it will tell you, like, here's who wrote this. Here's who they were writing to. Here are the, here's the date. Here's the time period. Here's the circumstances. Here are the questions being addressed in this. And just reading through that gives you some context that will help you better understand what is going on. You do that all the time, naturally. When, if you get a letter in the mail, almost the first thing you do is, who is this from? Don't you look and see who it's from? And, you, and then you look to see, well, who is it addressed to in the family? And, and you just, you're, you're, you're reading it kind of thinking, well, wonder why they wrote me. So just basic questions like that are so important when you're reading the Bible. So don't treat the Bible like a magic book. Treat it like a book that God, is, it's a supernatural book, but it's a book that was written by God through humans, for humans, using human language. So use some basic human skills and common sense when you're reading the Bible. So it would be helpful to start at the beginning of the book and read all the way through it. Now, you don't have, now when I say that, let me clarify something. That doesn't mean that for you to understand the Bible, you have to start at Genesis 1-1 at the very beginning because the Bible is actually 66 books. It's a collection of 66 different books. But I would encourage you that when you're reading, and if you're new to this, I would start in the New Testament, but I would begin at the beginning of whatever book of the New Testament you choose. And then you don't have to read the whole thing, 
but it's good if you can, but most of the time we can't do that. But if you read a chapter and you read, you know, Ephesians chapter one, then tomorrow pick up in Ephesians chapter two, just sort of consistently go through it. And it will be very helpful to you in gaining a better understanding of the Bible. So read the Bible with some common sense. But the second principle that I want to share with you is that you need to read the Bible in dependency upon the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible, though it is a human book, been written by God through humans, it is a supernatural book. And because it is a supernatural word from God, you and I require his supernatural intervention and work in our lives to help us understand it. Do you remember that on, um, on the night that Jesus rose from the dead, his disciples were gathered in the upper room and they were terrified, locked the doors, and Jesus suddenly appears, the resurrected Christ before them, and they're, they're terrified and they're, they, they're startled and, 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 and confused. And, and so Jesus says to them in Luke chapter 24, verse 44, he said to them, he's explaining to them, that he had to die, he had, the Messiah had to die, be buried and rise from the dead. And he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that was written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. That's designation for the Old Testament. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. You see, Jesus had told them that he was going to die and rise from the dead over and over and over again. He had told them that time and time again, and somehow they just didn't get it. Somehow it just like went right over their head. They just didn't understand it. But on this night, he opens their minds so they can understand the scriptures. The supernatural work of the Holy Spirit is to do the same thing for you and me. You see, Jesus had said to his disciples on the night he was betrayed, he said, I'm going to go away, but I'm not going to leave you like an orphan. I'm going to come back to you in the person of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is with you. He shall be in you. And when on that day, when that happens, he's going to start doing for you what I've been doing for you. So he says to John 16, he says, it's better for you that I go away. If I don't go away, he won't come. And if Jesus then says in John 16, 12, I have so much more I want to say to you, but you can't bear it now. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, then you'll be able to understand it. Then he will, he will hear what I'm saying. He, I will speak and then he will tell you what I want you to know. He said he will take from what is mine and make it known, reveal it to you. It's the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit to speak to you and to reveal to you what Jesus wants to say to you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says in verse 9, however as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except his own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Well, what we have received is not the Spirit of the world. We receive the Spirit who's from God. The Spirit who knows the thoughts of God now lives in you. So that, what we, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not with words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness. They cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The Spirit of God who lives in you as a child of God, this passage clearly, unmistakably says, he knows the thoughts of God, he now lives in you, and he's been given to you so that you can understand 
what has been freely given to us in Christ. God wants to speak to you through his word, through the scriptures being opened to you. And so when God speaks to you, it's because he opens your mind and opens your understanding. We are dependent upon the Holy Spirit to understand what God wants us to know. So when you get ready to read your Bible, you read it with common sense because it's written for humans by God through humans. But when you read it, read it in dependency upon the Spirit of God. Before you start reading, say, dear God, I want to hear from you and I know I will not hear from you unless you speak to me by your spirit. Spirit of God, open my understanding that I will hear what you want me to know. Just pray dependent upon him to speak to you. So read the Bible with common sense. Read the Bible with dependency upon the spirit. A third principle is when you read the Bible, read it with expectancy. Read it believing that God is in fact going to speak to you. This is incredibly important because whatever is not of faith is sin. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven six that without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if you read the Bible, but you don't expect God to speak to you, then you're actually grieving him. You think about this. God has put his spirit inside. God went to all the trouble of writing the Bible. He's preserved it down through the century so that we have copies of it. He gave his, you a personal private tutor in the person of the Holy Spirit so that he could talk to you through this, so that he could reveal this and open your understanding, and then you and I get ready to do it, and we don't expect it to happen. And our unbelief grieves God. We're told in James chapter 1, Verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. God says, I, I, want to, I want to give you wisdom. I'm generous. I want to do this. So do you want it? Then ask me. But when you ask me, believe I'm going to give it to you. So what God wants you to do is he wants you to take his word, be dependent upon him, read it with common sense, but then ask him to speak to you and then believe that what you're about to read is what he wanted you to read and that he is speaking to you through this. Now, sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that the, we sort of read the Bible passively. We sit back and we sort of read it, waiting for some new information to jump off the page. We're waiting for, to see something we've never seen before. We, we, we're waiting to learn something I've never known. And if that doesn't happen, if I read something and I think, well, I already knew that, then somehow we think God didn't speak to us. But many times God is speaking to you and he's not telling you something you don't know. He's telling you something you know that he wants you to do. He's, he, you, maybe you know it, but he's pointing it out to you and saying, this is for you today. So one of the things that is, can be very helpful to you to get you in this pattern of expectation is I would encourage you, if this is something you're struggling with and you'd like some help, then when you get ready to read your Bible, get a notebook and a pen or a pencil. And as you ask God to speak to you, you're going to read a passage of Scripture, then take this notebook and write that day's date on it, write the Scripture verse, and then with pen in hand, get ready to write down what it is God is going to say to you. It's an amazing thing how pen in hand takes you from being a passive reader to an active one. I'm getting ready to write this. What are you going to say to me? Makes a huge difference. Then what I would encourage you, read. Ever how much you want to read there. It could be a verse, it could be a paragraph, a chapter, whatever you 
feel led to read. But when you read that, then just stop for a moment and say, God, what are you saying to me? What do you want me to know from this passage? And it may be something you've heard a hundred times in your life. It's okay. Write that down. Because that's what God is saying to you. Now, let's just suppose that you, um, you come across, you're, you're in your daily reading. You, you've started consistently. I'm picking up today where I left off yesterday. I'm expecting that God's going to have something for me in this passage. And so, I read this passage. And let's say that the passage says, uh, give and it shall be given to you. Press down, shake it together, running over, shall be given to your bosom. And so, this is a verse. You've got it memorized, many of you. This is a verse you know. Well, in the past, you would have said, oh, well, I already know that. And you would have thought God wasn't speaking. But on this day, you're sitting here with pen in hand expecting God is going to speak. This is in your consistent reading. And I'm opening my Bible, and this is the passage today. I'm expecting you to speak to me, God. And you're saying, give and it shall be given unto you. So I write down in my journal, I write in my notes, Lord, what do you want me to know today is you want me to realize that if I, I can't outgive you, that if I will give, it will be given unto me. Later that day, you're going through the day and all of a sudden somebody at work comes up to you and they start talking to you about maybe some issue or some problem they've got. And suddenly you realize, you know what? I can do something about that. I can give them some time. I may can give them some money. I can, God is warning me, this was for me today to put into practice. See, the Spirit of God wants to speak to you, but He wants you to expect Him to speak to you. But if you don't do that, then what you'll do is you'll read that passage and you'll go, okay, well, I already knew that, so I guess God didn't have anything new for me today. You'll get up, go into the day, and you'll make no connection between what you read that day and what the events going on in your life. So read the Bible with common sense. Read it in dependency upon the Holy Spirit. Read it with expectation that God is going to speak to you. And the last thing I want to say to you is read the Bible obediently. Read it with an attitude of obedience. By that I mean you read it with the commitment up front that whatever you say, I'm going to do. One of the reasons we don't hear from God is because we're not really committed to obeying God. We're committed. We want to know what God's opinion on this issue is so we can decide if we want to do it or not. Maybe we have a decision to make, and so we kind of have our preference. Maybe other people are telling us what they want, and we go, God, you know, what do you want? And then my intentions are to sort of take these options and weigh my options and decide which one I want to do. And God says, mm, I don't do that. I'm Lord. Lord. And so I don't give options, I give instructions, I give direction, and I expect to be obeyed. So if you want to hear from God, then you up front say, Lord, whatever you say to me, I'm going to do. The answer is yes. Now what do you want me to do? Jesus said in John 7, he said, if anyone really wills to know God, you will to know the will of God, you desire to know what God wants, he said, then you'll know whether or not I'm really from God. It starts in the will. It starts with a desire to obey. That's critical. The Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at a, his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law, that's just a description of the scriptures, that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. You see, when we read the Bible and then we don't put it into practice, we don't do what it says, then the Bible says you're just deceiving yourself. If, if, if you're just picking the Bible up and reading it with no intention of doing it, 
And you're just checking off your to-do list of, you know, one of the things good Christians do is read their Bible every day. And I checked it off. I read my Bible, my daily Bible read. Then, then you're just deceiving yourself. If you come to church and you come every week and, and you sit here, but you have no intention of doing what God's going to say to you today, then you're deceiving yourself. God says in his word, he said, it's, it's like you're looking in a mirror and then not doing anything about what you see. I would imagine that everybody here, when you got up this morning, looked in the mirror, didn't you? Before you came to church. Now imagine if you got up today, looked in the mirror, saw all the adjustments you needed to make. You walked out of the bathroom, you went into the kitchen, made yourself some breakfast, then forgot about what you saw in the mirror. And so you went in, put your clothes on, and you came to church without making any adjustments. You've deceived yourself. You didn't deceive anybody else. Everybody else looks and knows you forgot to make adjustments. But if you look at the Bible, if you read the Bible and you don't do what it says, then, but you think somehow because I read it or somehow because I came to church and I heard a sermon and so I've done what I'm supposed to do, you're deceiving yourself. The Bible says do it. So when you're getting ready to read your Bible, you recognize that God wrote it. It's God's words, but he wrote it through people, for people in human language. So you're going to use some common sense. But it's also a supernatural book that requires the Spirit of God to open your understanding. So we're going to read it in dependence upon Him. But we're going to read it with some expectancy. We're going to believe that what we're about to read is what God wants me to know today. Whether it's new information or not, this is for me today. And I'm going to read it with the intent to do what this passage says. And if you will do that, What's going to happen is the Spirit of God who's in you is going to open your understanding. He is going to speak to you through the Word, and your spiritual life is going to ignite. Your passion and love for the Word and your love for God is going to just ignite. The relationship you have with God is going to become very real. You remember Jesus joining with two of his disciples the day he rose from the dead. Two of the disciples are on their way to the village of Emmaus. And they're walking along and they're discouraged and downcast talking about the events that's happened over the weekend. And Jesus joins them. And he says, what are you guys talking about? Why are you sad? And they went, are you a stranger? You don't know what's happened in Jerusalem this weekend? The one we thought was the Messiah was crucified. He's been buried. And now some of the women from our group, as long as, along with some of our, our friends, went to the tomb and they can't find the body. And they don't know, we don't know what happened to him. And the Bible says that Jesus, beginning with Moses, beginning in the, the first five books of the Bible, began to explain to them what the Scripture said about how the Messiah had to suffer and die and be raised again. And it says he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. When they arrive at the place where these guys are staying, they invite Jesus to stay with them. And Jesus at supper then takes the bread, breaks it, blesses it. And suddenly they, their eyes are open. They realize who he is and he disappears. And they turn to one another and they said, did our hearts not burn within us? while he talked with us and opened the scriptures to us along the way. I'm telling you, there is an, the Spirit of God who lives in you will ignite this flame and passion for God and the things of God when you hear from him through his word. He longs for that to be your experience on a consistent basis. So trust him and expect him to do that. I want you to bow your heads. So what are you going to do with what you've heard today? Don't deceive yourself by not making some adjustments today. What do you need to do? That's between you and God, but what do you need to do? Maybe there's some who are here today, maybe some watching right now on our broadcast. Maybe you, you don't have a relationship with God. Do you know that it's an amazing thing that the the creator of the universe created you. 
and he created you because he wants to have a relationship with you. Really. He wants you to know him and he wants you to live with him forever. But here's the problem. The problem is we've all sinned and we've all disobeyed God and we've all rebelled against God and we've all done it a lot. And the Bible says that our disobedience separates us from God, creates a barrier between us and God that we cannot remove. But God so loves you and so wants a relationship with you that he sent Jesus into the world. And when Jesus came, he died on the cross to pay for your sin. He died there as a substitute for you and for me to answer for our sin, to pay for it so that you and I wouldn't have to. And just before he died, he cried with a loud voice and in the language he was speaking, he used a term that meant paid in full. Your sin debt was paid in full. Everything that needed to happen so that God could forgive you and you could have a relationship with God paid in full. And three days later, God raised him from the dead. And when God raised him from the dead, it was a gigantic announcement to say the payment has been accepted. And now the Bible says that to everyone who will call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. To as many as received Jesus, to them he gives the right to become children of God, even to them that believe on his name. God's offering to you today a relationship with him. He's offering it to you as a free gift. It doesn't, you can't do anything for it except ask him for it. And the gift is his son, Jesus. He says, I'm offering you my son, Jesus. And if you'll receive him, you'll become my child. You'll be forgiven of your sins. You'll get a home in heaven and so much more. But he says, it's, it's a gift. Do you want it? If you want it, you have to have enough faith to ask for it. Do you want it? Then all you have to do is ask him for it right now. You can pray something like this. Lord Jesus, I know that I have disobeyed you a lot. And my sins have separated me from God. And there's nothing I can do to make this right. But I believe you died on the cross to pay for my sin. I believe you were judged in my place. And I believe when God raised you from the dead that he was declaring the payment had been accepted. So I'm asking you to come into my life. Save me from my sins. Make me a child of God. And from this day forward, I will follow you. Thank you for hearing my prayer. If you prayed that prayer today and you meant it, then I would like to welcome you to the family of God. You know, almost every week, someone in the, one of our services prays that prayer with me and they give their life to Jesus. And if that was you today, then I just want to tell you, we are so thrilled for you today. We would love to be a part of what God has now started in your life. And maybe if you just gave your life to Jesus, you just got a brand new start and there's, everything's brand new to you. And you may be thinking, well, well, now what? Well, that's the purpose of a church is to help you know what, what do you do next and how do you get to know God better? So if you prayed that with me, if you wouldn't mind taking the gray card, the seat back in front of you, fill that out and then just check the box that says, I prayed today to ask Jesus to save me from my sins. Then take that card and drop it in one of the offering boxes as you make your way out today. And if you do that, we'll contact you this week, try to set up a time at your convenience to just uh, help you know what well, now what and just rejoice with you over this brand new beginning. We'd love to do that. It'd be our honor to do that. Maybe you'd like to be baptized or maybe you'd like to join the church. Just take that gray card and check the appropriate box and drop it in the offering box as you make your way out. Maybe you're our guest here today. 
If you are, thank you so much for coming. I know there are churches everywhere you could have gone to, and for you to come today means so much to us, and I thank you for being here. I hope sincerely that this was an encouragement to you and a blessing to you. And if it was, you could encourage us by taking the blue card that's in the seat back in front of you. It just is a guest registration card, a connection card. It just takes you 10 seconds to fill it out. And when you do that, we have a special gift for you. We have a gift on, and at the tables in the back. There are some books there by Josh McDowell called More Than a Carpenter. It is a book that is an excellent book. It's an easy read. It's not very long. Uh, but if you read that book, it gives you how do you know that Jesus really physically rose from the dead? Is there, can you prove that? He gives you evidences and proof. How do we know that Jesus is really who he said he was? And so some wonderful topics in there that will just help you and maybe something that you may want to give to somebody else. So if you're our guest, it's our gift to you, our investment in your life. I hope you'll pick one up uh, before you leave today. So I hope that you'll do that. For all the rest of you today, you could drop something in the offering box as well. You could drop your offerings in there as you make your way out, or you can give online if you would prefer to do that. Before we go, I just want to say a special thank you to all the people who worked so diligently in our Vacation Bible School this week. Our, um, our teams did an amazing job. They actually did two Vacation Bible Schools this week. They did one every morning, Monday through Thursday, for our academy children. And uh, just an amazing thing. And then turned around and did it again at night for the children of our church. As a result of that, over 120 children heard how to know God through a relationship with Jesus Christ. What an extraordinary uh, uh, event that took place this week. And that would not have been possible had it not been for our diligent uh, wonderful, faithful servants of God in our church. They probably slept really good the next day. And so um, I am so grateful for Miss Abby and for all of our teams who pulled that off. So thank you all very, very much. Now, thank you for putting up with my infirmities today. And let's stand together and we'll be dismissed. Father, I pray that this week would be just transformational in the life of every person here and every person listening. May we approach your fabulous word with expectation this week that you're going to communicate to us. And I pray that you would ignite in the heart of every one of your children a love and a passion for you and your word and the things of God that's been greater than they've ever had before. May this just be an astounding week for each of them. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Thank you for coming.